Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Yeah, you may notice I'm wearing a brand new t-shirt with a paretic chart. Yeah, for chemistry. And it says, paretically, I'm sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, I got this at Big Lots for five bucks. And I'm not into chemistry, but I know my mom is, since she takes it in college. But hey, it works with style. <laughs> um, I've been busy lately. I know, I know. I just never have time to do many videos other than just posting some commercial breaks that I found online. So I just want to take some time to relax and because we had to um, for the family alone, we we actually bought a brand new sink cabinet for the bathroom. The second bathroom, yeah, because I have two bathrooms uh, in this room. But the one that's in the hallway, we had it replaced because uh, it was all moldy. It was having some problems, you know, with the water pressure. That's what's causing this to happen. So we had to take it down. And we got a brand new one that we had to bring it up and we put it all together using glue using a brand new faucet to go with it we had to put everything together so it can work and so far so good it did so it wasn't splashing anywhere or anything and it wasn't having problems with the pipes or, or nothing so so far so good but we needed to replace the mirror too so that way we can use it so everything will be alright yeah, it's a vanity mirror and we also had to fix the faucet for the kitchen because it was having problems too it had some leaking on the hose and it, it causes a lot of leakage so we had to fix that too thank god it, it was a lot of hard work but I'm just glad that now everything's back to the way it is so we can wash dishes and we get to uh, you know, wash our hands and all in the bathroom and all. Okay, well, moving along, I did finally watch a movie this week. You know, I had to take some time to relax. And the movie that I'm going to be reviewing this week is, surprisingly enough, celebrating its 20th anniversary. A sci-fi, post-apocalyptic animated feature, Titan A.E., which A.E. stands for After Earth, which the story basically sets on a Project Titan that was a spacecraft that's hidden somewhere, where you have one, where you have um, a young man by the name of by the name of Crane, uh, Kale. We actually have a young man by the name of Kale, which is right here. He's voiced by Matt Damon. He's joining in with um, a space pilot who's very beautiful and very strong. Akima, right there, is voiced by Drew Barrymore. And he has the key by actually wearing the ring that he was given to his father, who's the professor. Sam Tucker was voiced by Ron Perlman to actually go all the way to the spacecraft so that way they can restore Earth back to life that was being destroyed by aliens known as Drax known as the Drakes yeah Drakes that's D-R-A-J yeah, so, so it sounds like Drake but of course, they're also joined in by the space pirates of sorts um, with uh, Captain Corso, voiced by Bill Pullman, a goon who is an amphibian um, scientist, um, voiced by John Leguizamo, and a, um, a pre, who's like a fruit bat type, a Reconadian. Um, who's voiced by Nathan Lane, and Stiff, who's a kangaroo-like um, Sagawan, who's voiced by Janine Galafio. 
and along with the rest of the voice cast here. And in my opinion, this was an excellent, well made, well done space adventure. That's, as critics had said right here on Hollywood Bites, this is the movie Star Wars fans have been waiting for. <laughs> this is a special edition DVD release that came out back in 2000, of course, 20 years ago, from 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment, and it has all the features right here on the back. Yep, and it's equipped with THX. <laughs> on the spine and on the back as well. Yeah, so you got the director's commentary of Don Bluth and Gary Goldman in their final film that they ever directed. Yeah, these are the same team behind films like An American Tale, The Land Before Time, The Sequel to Nim, also joining in with films like Rock -A Doodle, as well as Fumbelina, the Pebble and the Penguin, and the Troll in Central Park, and of course, Anastasia. That was their big surprise at the time. Yeah, so you got um, some great features joining in, like the Crest for Titan, which was a Fox Kids featurette that they aired on TV. Um, deleted scenes, only four. Um, they have uh, a music video, Over My Head, by Lit. It has an excellent soundtrack, by the way. Yeah, joining in with other uh, artists, like uh, Jama Kwai. Yeah, the same artist who sang um, Virtual Insanity and Canned Heat. Yeah, they got him. Um, they got other artists to join, like Power Man 500. Come to mind. <laughs> um, yeah, they got exclusive DVD ROM game link. Yeah, this is where they show you, um, you know, the games and other stuff that's included. It's just web links. Um, trailers and TV spots. So yeah, you only got the the last two trailers. There was a teaser trailer that would have been included on this set, but apparently you can find this on on a VHS tape of some of the other Fox titles um, in 1999 when it was released. It would have been nice if they included that. And they should have had more TV spots too, because I remember I seen some more when it aired on TV. I only found just two, so that's a shame. It's anamorphic widescreen, yep, 2x35, which is basically CinemaScope, as they refer to. You know, that classic CinemaScope that Fox has been putting out. Yeah, it has audio of DTS, English, joining in with Dolby Surround. Yeah, 5.1. So it gives it a nice uh, crystal clear sound of all these uh, <laughs> spaceships, you know, all these um, laser shooting and all, <laughs> everything. Yeah, of course, it has all the other audios and subtitles and all, yeah. That's what you get for this release. I hope this gets a Blu-ray, but I'm not so sure how long is this going to take. I mean, I know there's a high-definition print available. I know they have this on digital streaming. But this definitely needs a Blu-ray with all the special features included. Uh, I know there's a bootleg available. But I really would love to have a retail. <laughs> okay. Now for this movie, now for this film being amazing, with an excellent voice cast, wonderful soundtrack and all, and I know I'm repeating myself here, and, and some traditional animation blending in with CGI, because it's all done using the blue sky, and uh, Reality Check Studios, while well, the traditional animation was done by Fox Animation Studios, the same people behind Anastasia. What really went wrong? Well, this is where I started to feel, you know, very um, 
astounded when I found out that this movie bombed at the box office. It opened at number five against films like Shaft with Samuel Jackson joining in with Gone in 60 Seconds with Nicolas Cage and, and Angelina Jolie. Then we got uh, Big Mama's House, another 20th Century Fox film. I know it's 20th Century Studios under the sub-diary of Disney. But what else is new? Um, yeah, with Martin Lawrence um, as a cross-dressing uh, FBI agent trying to track down a killer. Um, then there's um, Mission Impossible 2. The surprising sequel with Tom Cruise joining in with Ben Rames, Fanny Newton, and even Anthony Hopkins making an appearance. Doug Ray Scott from Ever After Cinderella Story <laughs> playing the villain. What went wrong here? Was it because of the marketing? Or was it the controversy that was going on with the studio that led to this tragedy that's happening? Well, I guess that's the case. It might be. Because from what I heard, um, the studio actually had like, over 300 animation staffs uh, joining in to to create the the animation sequences and all, you know. But they only brought in 26 um, animators to create the traditional animation. And they brought in some other crew to create all the CGI animation blending in. And I, you know, they were laid off, they got fired. Wasn't so sure if, if they could stay in or not. But that was the case. I mean, I, I guess they were, it was a trouble production as it seems. Um, they brought in the script. Um, they had free writers, by the way, like Ben Edlon, John August, and even Josh Wheaton. Yes, the same writer behind Buffy the Vampire Slayer, along with Firefly and, and all. Angel, too. So, I guess, even though the story was actually written by Hans uh, Bayer and, and Randall McCormick, so they had to do some changes here. But, uh, regardless, though, they had a budget of 75 million and had to take 19 months to, to complete it. But I guess they were having some trouble here. However, um, they did brought in Paul Chain, who had worked for, for Anastasia, as well as the directed video sequel, Bartok the Magnificent, to do some um, concepts and, and all. Um, I mean, everything had to be hand built for the animation staff, and you know, using all these props and models and all. And they even had uh, actors performing some of these stunts that would um, actually use it as as a motion capture for the animation. So that way, you know, the animators can draw these particular scenes. Um, and they had to create um, all these spaceships, the Earth's destruction, all these planets, and and every and all the the wonderful visual special effects that they use into the film, like those laser shots and and all, and even those ice crystals that they put in, and all of that, all done with CGI. So it just looks as impressive as it could be, but it was a lot of hard work. Whatever the case, though, I still think this was well done, painstakingly. They did the best they could. Nobody's perfect. So let's begin with the review. It stars Matt Damon, joining in with Alex D. Lynn from uh, Home Alone Free, of course, One Fine Day, and Mass Keeble's Big Move, yeah. Bill Pullman, uh, John Leguizamo, Nathan Lane, Janine Galofio, Drew Barrymore, 
Tony Locke, or Lowe, a Jim Brewer, who was actually from the movie Half Bake, and he's actually a comedian from the TV series uh, sketch comedy Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Christopher uh, Scarbrosio, Jim Cummings, yeah, longtime voice actor, Charles Rockets, who of course um, was a former uh, cast member of Saturday Night Live, and he's no longer with us. Ken Hutton Campbell, uh, David Lander, and Roger L. Jackson. Yeah, if you're familiar with that voice actor, he does the voice of Mojo Jojo in the Powerpuff Girls. And yes, he was the more familiar voice as Ghostface in the Scream films. <laughs> yeah. It's, once again, written by Ben Edlon, John August, and Josh Wheaton, joining in based on the story by Hans Bayer and Randall McCoymick, and it's directed by Don Bluth and Gary Goldman. The movie began set in 328. Humanity has mastered a deep space travel to interact with several alien species, joining in with the Drakes, that are pure energy based alien species that somehow were planning to destroy the human race by destructing planet Earth. So, Professor Sam Tucker, voiced by Ron Perlman, had joined in with his crew to build an invention called Project Titan that will be used so they can be able to restore Earth if they had to destroy all these aliens around, which that's what they did for this evasion. So he's joining in with his son, Kale. Young Kale, who was voiced by Alex D. Lynn, who went on one of the evacuation ships with his alien friend, Tech, while Tucker and other members of his team had flied the Titan spacecraft into hyperspace. But the Dre's mothership arrives and fires um, the direct energy weapon that they got, destroying Earth as we know it, and him inside. But it also destroys the moon, too. So, the rest of the surviving humans have become nomads, gen generally recruited by other alien species to join, mostly these... Uh, typical like bug-like creatures or any um, animal-like ones that we got. So 15 years later has passed and Kale, who's now voiced by Matt Damon, had works as a savage yard in an asteroid belt called Taw 14. Which he's being tracked down by Captain, you're gonna love this, my, my name, Joseph Corso, who is voiced by Bill Pullman, he has a spaceship called Bataki, which he reveals so uh, that Tucker has encoded a map that he had um, ever since uh, his father gave it to him when he was young. Yeah, which was a, a gold uh, ring that actually secures uh, a map that could take him directly to spacecraft Titan, and that's where it'll lead to. So Tech tells Kale that humanity depends on finding the Titan, but when the Drakes had attacked the salvage yard, Kale had escaped aboard the Bataki with Corso, as they could, joining in with his crew. That includes a human female pilot named Akima, is voiced by Drew Barrymore. Joins in with um, all these creatures named Preed, Goon, and Stiff. Yeah, they're all voiced by Nathan Lane, John Leguizamo, and Janine Galafio. But when they went on to a planet called Surham, the gal had interpreted the map and discovers the Titan hidden somewhere in the Andala Nebula where it's then suddenly all the Drake's fighters had arrived capturing both Kale and Akima 
Yeah, and, and this particular planet has all these uh, possum, you know, firelight uh, flowers that they got. And they had all these uh, creatures that are like a cross between bats and, and birds, in a way. Sort of like hawks and that sort of particular. Um, so the Drakes had eventually discarded Akima and extracts the Titan map from Kale. But then Corso's crew had rescued Akima while Kale eventually escapes and Drake's ship and rejoins the group. So everything was turning out exactly as planned. But Kale's map suddenly changes and now shows Titan's final location. But they had to supply um, the human space station at New Bangkok, where Kao and Akima discovers, uh, and this is where it leads to one of the biggest spoilers, was that they're going to portray them, so they'll be able to find it themselves. But they escape the Bataki, and they wound up... Um, Stranded on New Bangkok, that's where we meet all the humans, you know, including the this, including this one lady, who just join, including the the mother who was just joining in with the kids. You know, they were playing soccer and just as it shows a photo of a soccer player, that was their father, I believe. But then. Akima was already shot by Corsmo, and somehow she fully recovers. And then Kao actually found a ship which was called the Phoenix. So that way they'll be able to head straight right to the Titan as, as they could. But they had to rebuild the entire um, ship get everything all working out within a day until it's finally ready. <laughs> so now both Kale and Akima have finally made it all the way there to Titan, but they have to get past all these uh, ice crystals that you saw. And I love the way they actually show those ice crystals, the way they did it. It almost it's starting to look almost like the, the Hall of Mirrors. You know, like if you go to a local carnival, you go inside a theme attraction of those those hall mirrors that you suddenly see one person inside the mirror, you thought maybe it might be, but then when you attack it's it's just a mirror. You know, just showing all these reflections and all. <laughs> well they were doing that too with the crystals where it shows all these reflections on the two ships, you know, the Phoenix and the Bataki. Yeah, and the Bataki of course is a giant ship that can pretty much hold everything. Um, so you see Corsmo along with uh, Pre, which they just, uh, well, not only attacked them, but they also started, they started to, you know, leave uh, both uh, Stiff and, and Goon around. I mean, Goon just got knocked out by an explosion of a bomb that Pre just sets uh, directly through uh, Stiff's watch. Um, but he fully recovers later on, too. Yeah, Goon is a mad scientist type, and apparently he begins to find out the location and all. Stiff, of course, is like the tough fighter here. <laughs> and very strong, too. Just does everything that she could. <laughs> You know, bring in some action, you know, shooting all these uh, aliens, destroying all these ships and all. Also helping out. So they realize that, yeah, both Corsmo and Pre are up to no good. Uh, finally, um, Kale and uh, Akima had arrived at Titan. And after they try to crash through, trying to pass the, the Bataki through these ice crystals, they finally made it there. And they have to get everything all set up when once he puts in the gold wing inside and you see like a message that's um, sent by Sam Tucker. 
holographic message. You know, before Cosmo and, and Pre just shows up and they're ready to attack them and then which also leads to all of this going on. But then but of course so uh, they had to start the Titans so that way it could restore Earth exactly back to life on or at this rate we built Earth so it'd be brand new known simply as New Earth which I guess at this rate K wants the nickname Planet Bob <laughs> so and that way all the humans can finally go back to their home where they belong and not in space yeah. and also to destroy all these aliens Okay. Um, therefore, I love the film. I really wish this movie got the attention it deserves. This is definitely the best space adventure we ever got in the 2000s, which was the new millennium at the time. I mean, there were a lot of space movies during that year, most of which had failed. Well, I did love uh, Red Planet, though, that came out that year. But that and, and Titan A.E. right here really works. Okay, It may have its flaws with, with the characters. Well, of course, because the usual cliche, you know, where one character that you're supposed to trust turned out to be the main villain, when in reality the villains are the aliens. Same goes with his um, sidekick joining in named Pre. Yeah, I guess they should have had fixed uh, half of the characters' traits here. Like, they didn't have to go for this cliche. And maybe focus a little bit more on the plot elements here. But for its 95 minute running time, I guess we could leave it at that. But all in all, I, I thought the film was breathtaking. I mean, it was incredibly stunning with the traditional animation all hand-drawn, blending in with CGI with all the spaceships, um, with all the, the planets and all these um, wonderful ice crystals that they show and all detailed with every uh, planet that we go to and, and even going inside the ship you can see all the places that they got. I mean, it's just amazing the way they did this an intergalactic thrill ride right there um, the characters were just excellent I loved them too I mean Kale is definitely a hot shot uh, type of character I mean he was intelligent but he was a yard salvager as he joins in and, and the fact that he has a map to go directly to Titan it has like a compass inside the, the gold ring uh, Akima, <laughs> I mean, voiced by Drew Barrymore, of course, um, was just, as she described it in, in the featurette, very sexy. But she's also a very strong uh, space pilot. Um, Phil Pullman, um, being the captain of the Vatican and a soldier himself, even though he's a bit of a, I guess you could say, space pirate, um, he was great as uh, Corso until you know, the whole cliche of him becoming a traitor which that's what led to uh, Pre uh, voiced by Nathan Lane um, and this is pretty interesting for Lane though because usually he would play like uh, a comic relief but not this time though he, he does act pretty cocky in a way um, Stiff of course uh, it's a very tough fighter, no doubt, as I explained it already. Voiced by Janine Galafio, and this is very interesting too, because usually she she always plays all these quirky type characters in, in her films, and yet alone some shows that she's done. So, so that was nice. Uh, Sam Tucker, the professor, voiced by Ron Perlman, in a very small role, but nevertheless um, it was nice because he was also the pilot um, because he was also the fodder 
that he helped Kale try to develop the, the project that they were working on. So this will help. Both Kale and Akima definitely have perfect chemistry together. No doubt. I mean, it really shows. Tech, of course, voiced by Tony Locke, was great. I mean, it's nice to hear his voice, you know, at, at that time. And, you know, and John Leguizamo doing the voice of Goon. He's like a mad scientist type, you know, trying to discover something. Even in this uh, kooky voice of his that he was given. Like, it was a pretty tough voice for him to do, but he did it. <laughs> Um, so it, it just, anyway, no doubt, I mean, the animation just looks spectacular, you know, blending in, again, with CGI and traditional hand-drawn animation, We you see the ice crystals, the spacecrafts, ships, the special effects with laser shots and all, and the way space looks. There's some awesome moments here where Kale was actually flying the ship, and which uh, Corsmo had let him try, you know, trying to have him teach him to fly, where he flies all the way inside a, um, in this particular planet and has all these um, angels flying around. And that's where you hear the song, you know, where you learn to fly. I thought that was really impressive. Some action scenes in there too. Even when they get blasted, you know, blood starts to shoot up too. You can definitely see blood, or you can definitely see, you know, some neck cracking and all. And I guess there's a bit of brief nudity in those other scenes too. Well, yeah, there was one moment where Kale was naked. <laughs> well, already, you know having to perform surgery by Akima, you know, just to heal these wounds that he had on his arm and his leg and and everything. <laughs> uh, there's also a moment too with Akima when she was taking a shower, but I know you don't really see it. It's just inside the, <laughs> the shower where she was just changing and her clothes, you know, just took off the towel and all, so of course and some love tender moments. I don't know. I mean it's pretty much what you can explain once you see it. And probably the main reason why they came there in the first place is so they can find everything that would have been here on Earth. You know, like finding some groceries and some green juice that they had to drink for survival and all. Yeah, they actually had a green juice machine inside, and they even have a kitchen, and all of this uh, material accessories, material utilities, and all. Yeah, I mean, there's even a restaurant too. We actually have a cook who's just uh, who's pretty much cooking food that's alive, and both humans and alien creatures had to wind up eating. But that's what they had to go for. They even have their own uh, laser guns, which they go around shooting all these aliens, too. Yeah, they even go on that slider, you know, so they can go to whatever they take you. And I saw this movie in theaters, though, uh, back when I was in high school, joining in with my brother, my sister, and my father. We, we all had a great time. It was the best film we actually got to see in theaters. And the way I saw it on the big screen just looks so breathtaking. And yeah, both uh, picture quality and sound at the time, you know, it was it just something you'll never forget. And I just, I wish people had experienced it back in the day. Uh, interesting enough, uh, I was projected at a digital cinema on two locations, uh, one in Atlanta, Georgia, and the other one in Los Angeles. So I guess they actually had the time to do so before it got released in theaters. So, so for, for those who actually had experienced it on a digital cinema screen, I mean, 
as projected it, I mean, it probably looks so incredible. You know, I bet if this film had been re-released today, maybe they would have gave it a 3D approach and stuff. But sadly, you know, I know that's never going to happen. But that's why, you know, I wish people had checked this out. And it's definitely one of the better films that Don Bluth and Gary Goldman has ever done. I mean, I mean, I'll definitely rather watch this than The Pebble and the Penguin. That's for sure. And definitely uh, rather watch this than The Troll in Central Park. Yeah. But, hey, I mean, I think everyone begs to differ. It's like a Star Wars movie, but only quite different. Uh, the story was excellent, too. I mean, well written as they could, even if they had some trouble, but that's okay. There actually was going to be a video game. If you look at the end credits, um, it'll definitely explain that they were going to plan on getting one, but due to the fact that the film didn't do so well at the box office, they had to cancel it. That's a shame. But all in all, I think they did the best they could, and this is why this movie deserves a lot of attention and and it always will be remembered no matter what that's why I consider this film a very underrated gem so. but therefore um, if you must um, check this film out you'll definitely appreciate it, it's fun so that's Titan AE and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.